go from selfish to selfless and oh, everything's ego-based. Why should I listen to you? Pastor, have you mastered your breath? Can you stop the aging process? You know what I'm saying? Do you know your destiny? Can you help someone else? What's today's topic? Arrogance. We got to deal with that. Arrogance comes from the word um, arrow gates. And it means to seize without right. Y'all would have never thought arrogance meant that. Like, to seize, I thought arrogance means you think you're too good. Arrogance means to seize without right. Right is defined as privilege, power, given by law or nature to seize without right. When we're talking about spiritual arrogance, we're talking about um, etiquette, actually. The importance of spiritual etiquette. Now, in every arena, whether it's politics, whether it's the temple, whether it's home, or whether it's in conversation, y'all all know that there's rules of engagement, right? Cool. There's certain written rules and there's certain unwritten rules. We all know this, right? You're supposed to intuit certain things. And everybody's supposed to be all deep. So now, when you come to the temple, do we really need to write on the wall no cussing, no loud music, Ten. no farting, Ten. no eating? <laughs> Ten. Right? It's common sense, rules of engagement. So if you come in, you're supposed to look around, you smell the incense, you're like, yeah. look around again. What happens when you look twice? What does that mean? One last, last community. Three ones. Respect. It means you just start to develop a respect for what's going on. Right? That's one scenario. Second scenario, your house. If you come to my house and you open the door, you look in and my house is like Japanese style. You know, in Japanese, don't we have no furniture, nothing. <laughs> Everything is just immaculately clean. You smell incense burning. You see the old children in the corner. And the bell chime. You look twice, right? You like, I feel like I might need to respect that. That's another scenario. You go to get a spiritual reader. You don't just go to anybody to get a spiritual reader, right? You go to check the person out, or you, you do some research on the person. So you look a few times, or you learn to respect the person that you're going to see. Now, if you go get a reading, that means you believe that this person has the ability to connect with the ancestors, the creator, whatever forces that they use to bring forth this wisdom to give you clarity in their life, right? So that's another scenario. So now let's go back to the top scenario. If you come through the doors in this temple, there's no rules written on the wall, no cussing, no and all of that stuff. You look around, you begin to intuit. I don't think I could cuss up in here. It's the unwritten rules, right? You're like, now, if you were to decide to start cussing and farting and eating and playing music, you would be being arrogant at that time, right? You don't have the right to break that rule at that point. You come in my house, you hear the bells and the chime, and your feet is all dirty from the streets out there, and you look around. Would you be being arrogant if you came in my house at that point? You go get a spiritual reading, you're supposed to be trusting in this connection, and when the reading comes back and it's telling you stuff you don't want to hear, and you just decide you don't believe no more, I don't know, I disagree with that. Would you be being arrogant at that time? No. And just know arrogance comes hand in hand with disrespect. You can't be arrogant without first disrespect. One of the most arrogant things to say is, our ancestors ain't had no religion, we just had a way of life. And the brother touched on that. And just for your information, if you want to piss me off, say some stuff like that. <laughs> that inspires the best communion. <laughs> <laughs> Our ancestors ain't had no. Teach hard. We split it in the, in the first side class. Let's do what does the word religion mean? Buying Buy back. Buying back to reconnect. All right. Let's deal with the history of why we have this reluctance to religion. It started at 325 AD. What happened at 325 AD? First, I Council of Nicaea. Council of Nicaea. Constantine is the birth of organized Christianity, right? What did they do? They used religion as a unifying force 
and a weapon to separate and enslave other people. So they use religion, the particular religion of Christianity, for world domination, right? We all know that. That's common history. That's where conscious people are choosing not to be religious because of that. But religion is neutral. What's wrong with connecting back? Right? There's nothing wrong with that. These ill-intentioned people use that for ill-gotten gain. So, right? They use it as a separating force. This upside to religion also. Religion has religion is point number one. It gives you an understanding of the Yitin Natir, the mother, father, creator. Two, it gives you a sense of identity. Whether that identity is real or false, it's going to give you an identity. So if we was in the nation of Islam, we'll say we're the tribe of what? Shabazz. Shabazz. Whether it's true or mythological, that empowers you. If you do good the nation of Islam, going far away off the tribe of Shabazz, right? Two. Going a long way. Off of the tribe of Shabazz, if we was Hebrew Israelites, we'll say we're what? <laughs> he said, we're the 12 tribes, ain't no like They said, light skinned people, y'all come from this tribe. And anybody in the island, y'all can, you know, and it's, it's unique. And it, gives, it takes you to a source, it gives you a sense of identity. Now, us in the comedic legacy or the conscious thing, we like to believe we have the truth just like everybody else believes they got the truth. We say it all came from Africa. We understand that the original the civilization started in Kush. That's the Fertile Crescent. Everything from Kemet all the way up until India, that was known as Kush. Mm -hmm. Right? That's why we call ourselves Kemetic Kushites. We practice a Kemetic expression of ancient Kushite culture that gives us our identity and takes us to a source, whether that source is historical or half mythological. Next point. It, it charges you with a goal or vision, whether that vision for Christians is in heaven or whether it's about kingdom building on earth. It charges you, say, this is what you need to do and this is how you're going to benefit from it. And this is how all of us are going to benefit from it together. Then it gives you codes on how to behave on your way to the goal. Is there anything wrong with any of that? Ten. Last, it tells you who your enemy is. Whether the enemy is the devil, whether it's the blue-eyed devil of the nation of Islam, whether it's, I think, the, Hit the Israelites think they're the devil too. Yeah. <laughs> whether we recognize the atrocities of people who happen to be white <laughs> in this legacy, we don't quite call them the devil, and that's a Christian, Judeo Christian term anyway. Or it's the other people over on the other side over there who's jealous of your skills and talents and don't want you to achieve your goals. It gives you this clarity like, okay, they're against us, we gotta get together because we don't want them breaking us up. So if you got people with ill intention who use this thing to unify themselves, to separate us so they can take over the world, and you could be good intention people using the same thing as a unifying force and a weapon to prevent them from further separation, right? Mm -hmm. What are the kings called in ancient Kemet? It's a video, and it means what? Unifying two lands. Unifying the two lands. Unify the two lands. What does that term mean, unifying the two lands? Simitawi. Simitawi. Now, how many kings were there? That was a dynasty. Approximately 330 kings, 114 generations. So, if you got kings called the Sitbidis and Zosimitawis and unifying of the land happened over and over again, right? So it's not about the unification, it's the reunification. Simitawi is reuniting the two lands. That's a political thing. But we know correspondence as above, so below. So the political translates into the spiritual. So technically, the ancient Kemite word for religion could be Simitawi, the unification, the reunification. What does religion mean again? Bind back. Reunification, ain't it pretty much the same thing? What does yoga mean? Bind body, body, mind. Union. Mm -hmm. But it's still the same thing. It's the same thing. So union, cemetery, religion. What happened to Asar? He got what? Uh, How many feet. pieces? You know, set. Brought them back together. That's religion. There is no word for religion. Our ancestors had what? When they say, 
culture. What is culture? Cultivate a way of life. The difference between the ancestors and you is back in ancient times, in ancient Kemet, everybody did it. There was no other religion in ancient Kemet, so they didn't have to call it a religion. And if they did, it would probably would have been called Simatawi or Perth and Peru, right? That makes sense. Right? There was no doing it, so there was no reason to reconnect if everybody stayed connected. But us Negroes, millions of miles away, we've been indoctrinated Christianity. Islam, Judaism, and all other types of stuff in the world. That's not a way of life for y'all. Y'all need religion. Y'all need to be pulled back. Y'all need to reconnect, right? Y'all need to reconnect with Africa, whether physically or spiritually, to that tradition. So you understand religion evolves into a different type of understanding when you understand what it really means. We're not defining religion by what they done in other traditions. Anybody know what the immune system does? What does the immune system do? Protect your health. 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 Outside people trying to indoctrinate us with their thoughts, right? So we done well. Some of y'all, late 20, 40 years old, over 40, you've been fighting it all your life. Now it's time to come back to your religion. You fighting your religion, right? Like an autoimmune, then your immune system is breaking down. Our tradition can't grow because we're attacking it now because we're still on guard from the rest of the tradition. It has to be used as a unifying force and a weapon to protect us from outside invasion. Islam is the fastest growing religion, right? So Christianity, they're, they're converting people by the millions in Africa every day. Judaism is growing. They got at least 14 million Jews, and here we are, I ain't religious. That's why nothing is happening in the cultural community because we don't want to do anything. We don't have a unifier. We don't have anything to serve as a weapon to stop us from further disconnecting from other people. So it says, that's what folks says. He says, oh, be not arrogant because of your knowledge. Knowledge is just accumulation of facts and information. Knowledge is no big deal. Everybody got knowledge. Go to Barnes and Noble and get knowledge. Lawyers get knowledge. The source of knowledge and all the black bookstores to get knowledge. You ain't doing nothing with knowledge accumulation of facts. He says, be not arrogant because of your knowledge. The ego comes with it. You see, it just equated arrogance with knowledge. You tend to start thinking you have the right to start disrespecting what's important to other people because of your knowledge. That's what's happening in the lecture circuit. I've studied these books and he didn't study these five, so I got more information than him. And he need to sit down and don't say nothing ever again in his life until he get caught up on these five books that he missed. That's how people act and that's the arrogant. Be not arrogant because of your knowledge. The rest of the quote, the part of the other quote says, wisdom is rare and emerald. See that you get knowledge anywhere, but wisdom, you gotta dig. Wisdom, emeralds is in the earth and in the mountain. So you have to become a philosopher.